Okay, um, welcome to the uh, Cupertino Library Foundation's uh, series on senior housing. And today we have uh, a first panel, which will be discussing uh, from the residents various, cho uh, various choices that they made on uh, their housing choices as seniors and discussing their plans and how do they get to these plans. Uh, the second panel coming up at two o'clock will be on financial considerations because the cost of senior housing plus as we discussed in the last set of series on memory care are two of the really largest uh, costs that we seniors face and unfortunately we well, there is no given budget schedule for how much we're going to need when and so it's it's always a very taxing thing and so we have Bobby Adams and uh, Karen Varshnia to talk about that. But uh, before I introduce my panel, I would actually like to welcome our mayor, uh, Darcy Paul, to give us a, a little bit of a, in, his insight on where the city's looking at housing and, and especially senior housing. Darcy. Great, thank you so much, Henry. And thank you everyone for being here today. I greatly appreciate this conversation on senior housing as well as the Cupertino Library Foundation for everything it does. It's uh, such an excellent organization and has brought the community together in the past and in the future on various important issues to discuss and uh, bring to the forefront in our community. Uh, the senior housing equation in Cupertino is of course critically important and we're very much taking um, a, a very serious eye on trying to make sure that we increase the amount of uh, housing stock across the board but especially for senior housing. And, you know, fortunately we do have a, a couple of um, projects coming up that uh, not only provide a, a fairly significant amount of housing overall to, to the community, but also um, in one case, at least, uh, a significant amount of specialized senior housing um, and to make sure that the various facilities are available for uh, people that are aging and um, hopefully they can have uh, an option to um, move from their, their, their current um, living situation to uh, perhaps a more appropriate service oriented um, you know, situation. And, and that's in the Oaks Shopping Center. Uh, the project is known as Westport. There are a number of uh, places available uh, for uh, senior housing in particular. There's a memory care center that's uh, going into there. Um, but what I'd like to do uh, very briefly is uh, to th talk about a couple of things that may not necessarily get um, you know, heavy coverage uh, with regard to the overall uh, conversation, uh, but they are a couple of policy pieces that uh, definitely uh, have a very important effect upon uh, where we go with the senior housing um, calculus. And uh, of course, this is a situation that is only going to become more important as we go along since we have an aging population. Um, the first is the concept of trying to make sure that we have a, a very inclusionary uh, motif. And by that, I mean, you know, oftentimes you see uh, a lot of developments that are uh, occurring, they get approved. And what we try to do is to try to have as many people as possible interacting with each other. And um, from a policy perspective, um, it's, it's really important that we have the senior population in there as well. And um, it, it's often uh, challenging to try to do that, but uh, a lot of the times, if you have the right design uh, to these types of um, uh, developments, then you're able to, uh, by design, have more of those types of interactions. And so I, I hope uh, going forward, as we're looking to uh, various projects and um, as these projects you know, evolve over time, we, we do think about the opportunities we have to get people from the community to interact with our, our senior population population as well. So I, I do believe that that's a priority of our community as well as of our council. And, um, you know, inclusionary zoning is something that has been uh, something that's frankly been a little bit difficult uh, to try to uh, coax out of the development community over the last couple of decades. But I think it's very, very sound uh, policy to try to get various aspects of the community and think about ways that we can uh, help uh, intermingle. I, I think it's really good for uh, not just um, you know the community at large, it's good for the senior population. And of course, um, the people that are benefiting from the exposure um, that the senior population represents in terms of experience and knowledge and wisdom, 
uh, it, that, that's something that you really can't measure in terms of its value. The other part of it, I think that we need to very much focus on, and uh, I think it's been getting a little bit less attention lately, is the, is the whole uh, idea of, of transportation and how to get people interconnected with each other. And so um, as we're going along, you know, think about uh, the various ways that we can try to promote things like more innovative transit, for instance. It's very interesting, the things that are going on uh, in the field of self-driving. Um, and there are also ways in which we can interconnect various parts of our community. Um, I, I commend Cupertino Library Foundation once again. Uh, I also commend all the various nonprofits out there. I know that there are some student organizations that are there to try to specifically outreach to the senior population and help us you know, get those interconnections going as well. And so thank you very much for bringing this forward. And I very much hope in your conversations today with regard to uh, particular preferences on senior housing, as well as thank you for the financial advice as well. Um, and, and the kind offer of, um, you know, people's time to, you know, provide that wisdom uh, that we move the ball forward. And uh, once again, I'll uh, bring it back to, to Henry. Thanks much. Thank you very much, Mayor, Mayor Paul. Uh, you know, it's, it's really important to, to hear you say the words about including the seniors in the decision making process, because as you know, you know, I've got gray in my hair. And <laughs> I came here when I was in my 20s and all of a sudden, you know, I'm an old guy now, right? And I think that happened to a lot of us. So anyway, well, with that, I want to introduce our panel. Uh, we have three residents who represent various different types of housing decisions. Uh, we have Jean Bedord and, uh, oh yes, also we are starting a poll. I, I, it's, it's a number of questions, but I really like for you to get as many inputs on this as possible. I, I apologize for being detailed, but it helps. We lost you, uh, Henry. We don't have audio. Oops, Henry, we lost your audio. All right. Henry, we lost your audio, so uh if can you oh, can you hear me now yes yeah. you're back okay uh i don't know what i did i did i get through introducing people or not no okay well let me start again i apologize uh so first of all there is a poll that's out there we'd like for you to answer some of the questions on that i'll introduce gene bedord who has been a resident for many years in cupertino it's one of my neighbors so about three blocks away mahesh nihalani who has uh, been uh, a resident of Cupertino, recently moved a few years ago to Santa Clara, where he is managing Priya Living. And uh, Dave Stearns, who's also another long-term resident of Cupertino, also former, another former head of Rotary, and is, uh, is out at the forum. Uh, and uh, as I said, there is a poll going on. There's also a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to uh, put uh, questions there. And if you have any other things, questions, you know, things you need to deal with the panel, you can hit us on chat. Okay, with that, um, Jean, let me, uh, oh, I know one other thing I wanted to show. Because we are a, Cupertino has traditionally been a, um, a city of families. I know I came here with my family. I wanted to share this, 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 this graphic. Uh, this came from the census, not this last census, the one before. But you can see that what will happen is where we used to have far more children than we had seniors like myself. Now we will soon, you know, very shortly, we'll have more seniors than we will have children. And that's a huge change for, for Santa Clara County and Cupertino itself. With that, let me hand it over to Jean. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jean Bedord, and I've lived here in Cupertino for over 25 years. And like uh, Henry, I came here when my son was young, and I am still here. 
except that now I, my husband and I are in a too big uh, family home that we know is probably not going to work for us in sometime in the future. Um, I have been active in civic affairs. You may have seen me speaking at city council. Um, I publish a newsletter called C uh, Cupertino Matters, and I'm also president of the Cupertino Senior Center Advisory Council. I'm part of the Age-Friendly Task Force, as well as Cupertino for All. Um, and I, at one point, served on the City Library Commission uh, after teaching uh, at uh, San Jose State University for over 10 years. So the online environment is very comfortable for me. Mahesh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, good morning. My name is Mahesh Nehilani, and uh, I have been a resident, my family and I have been residents of Cupertino for over 18 years until we decided that we retire and move back to India. And uh, at that particular moment, this opportunity came up uh, in Santa Clara where Priya Living uh, was opened up and uh, I was invited to come and take a look at it and to see what I could do to help them. I was very, very awed by this facility where you could actually, when you enter, feel the vibe and the positive energy and the warmth and everything. And I, my wife and I decided that we'll stay back. So Priya Living is basically uh, a senior independent living facility, uh, which was started in 2014, 13, 14, and a uh, small facility, 26 units. But the whole concept and the vision of Priya Living by its uh, founder, Arun Paul, was to have a place where, you know, everybody lives together like a family. There is no loneliness. There's only happiness. And the fun of life never ends. And I am very happy and proud to say that in the last seven years, we have been able to achieve that. We have grown now from one prior living to three prior livings in the Bay Area, one in Los Angeles. And as we speak, we are opening one in each one of the 60 major metros across the US. So prior living, there was a, we felt there's a big need for something like this. And we realized that when we started prior living and we felt that prior living and facilities like that will should not, not just be a business, but they should be more of a service thing where you feel you're doing service to the seniors and that's exactly why how and these things will be successful so we are very happy with priya living and we are happy that we're expanding all over the us too thank you Dave, can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, sorry, didn't hear that. Every once in a while, Henry, your your audio goes away. Uh, yeah, I'm Dave Stearns. I've uh, lived in Cupertino since 1977. And about six years ago, uh, my wife and I decided to leave our family home in, down in, uh, in Cupertino, not too far from the old Valco, and move to the Forum. It's a continuing care retirement community. It combines... Uh, independent living for seniors along with a health center. You could think of it as kind of a condo association that owns its own health center. And uh, the advantage of that is you effectively are picking your own nursing home. It's kind of a gift to your kids. And it gives a level of confidence to uh, those of us of a certain age who are facing what I call the event. Uh, you know what's gonna happen. It's gonna be stroke, cancer, heart attack, fall, whatever it is, it, it will happen as you age. And at 75, I'm well past my use-by date. Uh, nothing too serious has happened yet, but I'm living happily in independent living and uh, look forward to spending time when I need to down at the health center. So that's all I've got for right now, Henry. Dave, uh, just one question on that. About what percentage of the uh, people at the forum are in independent mode versus in something like assisted living or... Uh, oh, the majority. Uh, there's probably about uh, four to 500 people here. I don't know the exact census. And three to 400 of them are living independently. Most everybody is in uh, one or two bedroom units, maybe the independent buildings, the villas. Uh, and the health center has uh, roughly 18 memory units, uh, roughly equivalent 
probably smaller number of skilled nursing beds, which are used often in transit, and a bunch of assisted living places for people who really can't live independently anymore and need a, uh, a daily help with something. Okay, thank you. You know, one of the things that I realized that probably also didn't happen when I was, uh, my microphone went out, was I didn't introduce my co-moderator, who is Hong Wei Chen, who is also a city council member. Now, Hong Wei, you're muted, so you should unmute yourself so that you can participate in this as well. Well, um, so one of the, so now you've introduced yourself and everything. The first question I have is, how did you get to the decision that, that you made? Because, you know, there's, there's both the decision, do I want to go to a CCRC? Do I want to go to an independent, strictly an independent living facility? Do I want to age in place? And, and how, how did you got to get there? Who'd like to start with that one? Well, I can start. Uh, my wife reminded me I really ought not be climbing on the roof to fix things anymore since <laughs> my balance wasn't uh, improving. Uh, you know, as I said, you could, I could see the oncoming effects of aging. And while I liked my house a lot, uh, it had no longer become a place where my wife and I could live comfortably uh, and without fear. Like the neighbor's house had been burglarized a couple of times. And uh, we're, you know, we're both 75 now. It's, uh, you know, age is coming. Uh, and we really liked the forum. I've liked it since it was built 30 years ago. I remember admiring it when it first got put up and thinking, gee, I'd like to live there someday. And finally, we decided it was the right place for us. I like Cupertino, and uh, it's, it's you know, one of only two continuing care places in Cupertino, the other one being Sunnyview down the street from us on Foothill. Right. Um, Mahesh, what about you? You, you? you made a choice to actually leave our beautiful city just to go a few miles away. Well, actually, you know, when my wife and I decided that we were going to retire uh, from the business, the jewelry business that we were in, we decided to move back to India, uh, you know, back to home because we have family back home too. And we built this beautiful uh, home in Pune. And, uh, but then like, since our children were here, we thought we'd keep coming back till we were able to take the fl long flights. But that was the decision we had taken. So the idea was to move back to India. Uh, this uh, opportunity of coming to stay at Priya Living and, you know, work there uh, came up all of a sudden. I'm out of the blue. I think somebody just recommended me to the owners of Priya Living and said, hey, Mahesh Nelani is retiring and going back to India. Why don't you get hold of him before he goes? And so, you know, we met Destiny and uh, here we are at Priya Living. And uh, like I said, one moment I saw Priya Living and what the the vision and the mission of this uh, organization was, I really felt that I could be a great help and do my little bit to be able to bring happiness in the lives of seniors. And so, uh, so, so let me, let me ask. So you, before this, you didn't know anything about Priya living. Is that no, right? No. So, so the thing is, it's an interesting one. So you'd be a perfect example of you going along, you made a plan, but you really don't actually know what all the options are. Exactly. I mean, we were aware of the options that we are going back to India because we have our you know, schoolmates out there, our family mm -hmm. out there, retirement there, and India is a place we grew up in before we came to the U.S. So we know the place. So the options was clear as far as that was concerned, but the option of being here in a senior retirement community was not there. And uh, in a way, we are happy that we stayed back and you know we are enjoying well, every moment of our life here. So uh, a few of us actually went over to, to visit Priya Living about a month ago and meet Mahesh. And um, it, it's, not, it's not what people would traditionally think of as an old people's home, right? <laughs> I mean, we were over there and there was this, there was this big laughter yoga session going on. People were setting up tables to share food and there was a book signing because one of the guys, I mean, he was a pretty old guy too. He was like yes. in his 80s, right? He had just written a book and, and some 16-year-old kid or 15-year-old kid had come and helped him produce it. So it was like, yeah, this is this is popping, right? And and that's I think that's the other thing too, is that for us baby boomers, um, you know, retirement doesn't necessarily have to be the same as it was 20, 30 years ago. And yes. I know the same thing happens at, at the forum because they're always doing stuff out there. They've been trying to recruit me as well. Well, Gee, 80s, is, I'd like to make the point that 80 is not that old. 80s, yeah, you know, I, I, talked, I, talked, 
I talked with uh, the director out there and she's told me that they used to have celebrations when people hit 90 and 100, but they had so many that <laughs> they just many. started to group it together into like half year or one year things. <laughs> yeah. So a question for Dave and Mahesh is this um, type of living, does it make you feel you're part of the community? Is that an important part for being you know, in the community for the next 10, 20 years and, and be part of a bigger family? So you're not uh, being isolated and then in your 90s have to move into somewhere. So is that a decision that that's part of the decision making process? Well, bo both these places are, uh, are, are independent living after all, we're not locked in our rooms. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure Mahesh and I would, would agree 100% on the fact that it's the life of the community that makes a lot of, of the value yeah. of living in a place like this. Uh, you, you, optionally, you could hold up in your room and not do much, but anybody who's socially inclined gets out and does things. They play bridge or go to the, uh, go down and talk to the book club or just sit down in the, in the, out in the open air and chat with people. There's a lot of pleasure in living with with a group of other people of the same age, yes. similar experiences. I think age age factor is very important. When you when you you know stay with people of your same age, you know same kind of uh, thoughts, same kind of uh, mindsets, it it is a much more happier and beautiful community. And like Dave just said, yes, you know it's it's just having these facilities and these programs available to you, and you being able to participate in that. In fact. In Priya Living, we go one step further. We encourage everybody. If we find that somebody is holed up in his or her room, we bring them out. Hold their hand, bring them out. Make them feel part of the community. That's why I have noticed now, and I proudly have to say that whenever anybody joined Priya Living for the first time, it took them just two or three days to become part of the family because everybody dropped in there, took them some cookies, called them for chai. That's kind of a family feeling. So it is good. And, uh, so, Jean, you're still in your big house. What, what do you think? Well, I'm in the big house more by default <laughs> because we haven't decided what the next steps will be. Mm -hmm. Plus, there are so limited options. You know, there's, you know, we, I did um, a talk about, you know, how many units were available at the various levels in the city of Cupertino. It's like 576, including the uh, new ones that will be put in at Westport. Um, so we're absolutely looking toward what will be the next steps. And part of this is because I've been through two bouts of caregiving and I know what the limitation, you know, limitations of aging in place are. It doesn't really exist. There comes a point at which you have to have additional care. Now, the first time happened when we moved my mother-in-law out from Chicago. Um, that was precipitated when my father-in-law passed away and she wasn't able to function on her own. Um, so we brought her out here and living with us was not really an option because it was unsafe in our house. We were gone during the day she had no friends, she didn't drive, and so her sole entertainment was television. Mm. So we settled her into Chateau Cupertino, which is independent living, and that really worked well for a while. There were meals, there were social programs, and all this sort of thing, but she fell and broke her wrist. Oh. Now in itself, that's not life-threatening, but guess what? She couldn't cut her food. She needed help with toileting, and Chateau Cupertino is not licensed to provide that level of care. So off we went to find assisted living. Well, we originally identified a facility, but when the time came, she didn't qualify for the level of care that they provided. And there's tremendous variability between, between facilities and what they offer. And that was something that we were totally unfamiliar with. So we finally found a place and were able to, and literally we had to do this within 48 hours because she fell and they said, you've got to find a different placement for her. And so we were able to find a place in Sunnyvale, not in Cupertino, that she was able to go to. Then this, we went through the same process as she was having dementia and increasingly physical problems. We had to find a skilled nursing facility for her. Again, each time she moved, she lost contact with anyone that she had made friends with the previous time. 
Now, my second bow that tells me that we're definitely going to have to look for something else is that my husband was in a bad auto accident. And so he spent several months in the hospital and then he went to skilled nursing back and forth a couple of times. Then uh, when Medicare ran out, I moved him to a high level assisted living, again, expiration. You have to go visit these facilities because the marketing brochures won't tell you whether they're dreary or not. <laughs> and then after that, when he was able to get from the wheelchair to the walker, I was able to bring him home. But that was his own problem. You know, he needed transportation. He couldn't get out of the house by himself. And so that's when adult daycare came into play. And thank heavens, because it provided a place for him to go during the day. And see, I was still teaching. And so, you know, I was not always available. So at this stage, we're back. It's, you know, it, we're, it's okay. But if anything happens to me or a deterioration in his health or mine, we're look, we have to find something else. And that's why I'm actively looking at alternatives. You know, so I, I think the, the set of, of examples you just gave goes back to what Dave says about the event, but there's multiple events, right? I mean, when you're talking about your, your mother-in-law, you had the first event with the husband passing, moving, which is a traumatic thing, right? Then going into Chateau Cupertino, you know, getting established there, but then have to move to an assisted living, then have to move to a skilled nursing. So, you know, the, the thing that I think a lot of people also need to understand, it's, it's actually a roadmap. Now, unfortunately, no one tells you when you're going to hit the next exit or the next decision point in the roadmap. But I think the key thing is, is to find opportunities. I mean, it sounds to me like you were lucky to find a place in Sunnyvale within a couple of days. And, and, and you're clearly right. I mean, you know, the other thing is they don't, they don't make it clear to us who haven't had to go through that, what's in and what's out in terms of acceptance, even into such a facility. So I think that that's kind of a critical point, which has got to be some of the advantage of doing what Dave decided to do and go to a place where you have kind of the, the full run. Now, it's, 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 it starts from independent and go all the way to, to skilled nursing. Um, Mahesh, though, in, in your place, which is independent, yeah. um, how many people actually stay there and have to transfer if, when another event happens? So, you know, we have in the Santa Clara facility, we have 26 units. We have about 34 people staying out here. Uh, in the past uh, seven years that I have been here, I have uh, uh, experienced that about six of them, you know, in time kind of came to a stage where they would need assistance or assisted living or some kind of a rehab because of dementia or something. Uh, so that has been those six people that we had to move there. And over the time we realized, of course, that you know it's very important that since we are growing now and building larger facilities with minimum of 120, 140 units, we will have a portion of these units available for assisted living or some kind of rehab so that the atmosphere and environment for those people doesn't change they still feel they're the same fun, happy place. So that's what our uh, vision now is going forward. And we will go with that. Uh, you know, that, yes. that, that's, that, I'm, I'm really happy to hear you say that because, you know, one of the last things you need to complicate it is to have to go to another place with, which is completely strange and which would be very inconvenient for my spouse or my friends to come to, to visit me, right? Exactly, yeah. That, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, I think that's why we finally uh, took this decision. I think uh, that we will definitely include assisted living and, and a little kind of skilled nursing thing as part of our ongoing new uh, Priya livings that will come up all over the U.S. Yes. Now, you, the, the Priya living that you're in is, is small compared to these new places that you're, you're talking about. I mean, do you expect the flavor to change a lot when you go from you know, 20 or 30 people up to 150? You know, we have, we have been in the last six, seven years doing this work on trying to find out how we can possibly, you know, scale up to a facility which from 26 units comes up to 140, 50 units. And I think we, we, we've been able to work out on programs and things that we will be able to have a similar kind. Not exactly the same because, you know, having 26 units and 30 people together in one place and having 
300 people, you know, in a, in a facility is going to be a little, little, diff little different. But then since they are brand new facilities that we are going to build, we're going to build all amenities that we have missed out having in our existing Priya livings. So I think we will have the same kind of happiness and same kind of family feelings in these bigger units also. Yeah, you know, one of the things, I don't know if you mentioned earlier, but you blew my socks off when you told me how many new facilities Priya Living has built. Could you tell us, share that, that number with the audience? Yeah, so at the moment, like I said, we have three in the Bay Area, one in Los Angeles opening up in the next three months. And we have, as we speak, 60, 60 Priya Living's coming up in 60 metros in the U.S. We are already starting construction in Allen, Texas, Houston, Texas, Chicago, Detroit, and Atlanta. And the wow. next two will be Philadelphia and Virginia. Wow. So, so Mahesh, um, what you're describing, because I'm just looking at a Q&A, attendee ask, is the city aware or considering co-housing developments? Would you say that these Priya developments are co-housing developments? Um, explain what do you mean by co-housing? Um, it says uh, provide affordable housing and opportunities for social interaction and less isolation for those living alone. Um, they are multi-generational or senior co-housing developments throughout the U.S. It looks like what you described on Priya Living's um, uh, model is a part of a senior co-housing living development. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we'll we have seniors living together. It's like co-housing. And of course, like I said, in pre LAV, we also give you this option that if you are alone, all right, and you want a friend of yours who's been your friend for a long time to come and live with you, you can share an apartment. There's no problem at all. And uh, we are also exploring the possibilities from what our research we have done is that based like in Europe, you have students coming to stay with seniors. So in probably in areas, maybe like Chicago or Detroit or wherever, or all these places, if we find and we screen these students who come from wherever they come from to, you know, uh, out of state to stay and study in universities, if we can house them there also. So we are looking at all those kind of avenues. Uh, but yes, like I said, like you said, Hank, we will definitely have uh, people, if these are going to be multi-generational, multicultural facilities and inclusive in every way. We will offer, of course, what we are offering in terms of an environment, which is typically you know, a warm, welcoming Indian uh, environment with food and all those kind of things. But it will be definitely inclusive and everybody and anybody is most welcome to come and stay with us. Actually, no, before, we, before, we, uh, before we go too far on this, I'd like to bring up the problem of, of staffing these facilities. It's, it's a major headache here at the Forum to find enough good employees to... Uh, work in not just independent living, you have a hard time keeping like servers down in the dining room, but it's a hard, hard problem to find RNs to work down to the health center. If you've got uh, a skilled nursing facility, you have to have round the clock RNs. They're not yeah. cheap to keep those, those, uh, those people on staff. Uh, in, the, in the case of a place that doesn't have a health center, they avoid that, but you still need to have maintenance people, kitchen people, whatever. And this is a very expensive labor market. So, uh, you know, something that, that hasn't come up in this context is a lot of people probably think about, gee, when I, when I retire from my house, I'll probably move. And they're trying to go someplace where labor is cheaper and the staying is a little less expensive. Well, you know, that, that, that actually brings up a, a critical question. And I think that the, uh, as, the, as our senior population grows, there's going to be a much larger demand for a lot of services people. Yes. You know, and, and so I think there's going to be this huge upswing in potential. And, and it, you're, you're right, Dave, it's, it's really quite unfair. If I had a really great employee who's really good with my patients and, and the residents, whether, whether they be a nurse or, or someone who just changes the beds, right? If they're a great employee, but they're going to have to travel two hours each direction yep. to live, that is a very big problem. And I think that, you know, when we look at Cupertino, if we want to have the very best employees, we have to look also at what do we need to do to make it possible for them to live close to us so that they could take these jobs. I, I, I know that, important. you know, I know that there are all kinds of issues with below market rate stuff if you go through certain government programs, but it's a problem that we need to face. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. On that on that point, uh, Henry, what Priya Living has thought about is that in our all our new facilities coming up because there are larger facilities. Uh, just to be you know sure about having our right kind of people working for us, we are going to build certain accommodation for our employees within Priya Living, so that they don't have to drive and travel a long distance. But like you said, Cupertino is a different market. You know, it's out of out of you know wherever the prices of property and land and everything. But I think the city of Cupertino, with its wonderful council people, and should definitely look at that and say, yes, we need to have our people, including service providers and senior living communities, to live close by. And if the city has to put in something along with the county and state, so be it. Create a facility where people can live and afford to be in that area so they can provide these services effectively. And seniors need this service. Yeah. Speaking of services, one of the areas that we haven't touched upon is dementia. And that is going to be an increasingly an increasing problem here as and, and it affects, you know, it usually affects one of the couple. And then if something happens, so there's one person, how does that person taken care of? Now, what we found in what I found in visiting assisted living facilities, so I had to be very sensitive to the cognitive level of the residents there because it's very frustrating if you have someone like my husband who is cognitively there, but not physically there, sitting at a dinner table with somebody who can't carry on a conversation. Yeah. Now, yeah. You know, ideally what you have is you have a mix so that the people who are having cognitive problems are just sort of listening in, but others can carry on the conversation. And the, of course, as they get older, this becomes an increasing problem. And these are not people who need skilled nursing as much as they need an environment in which they can function. And they can function for a very long time with a little bit of assistance. You know, you mentioned um, uh, adult daycare. And, uh, you know, we had a uh, series in July and early August on memory care. And I was surprised the number of, of uh, in the audience who had no clue that adult daycare exists. And in fact, we have the Live Oaks facility over near at, on the St. Jude um, Church Hot property in Cupertino that provides uh, adult daycare. But a lot of times you, that's just one element. The thing about these things of these services, you need a spectrum of elements. Right. And that, that, you know, just like you mentioned for the assisted living, same way with adult daycare. Sometimes you need the really light touch stuff. And sometimes you need the very, very heavily supervised stuff. But well, it's, it's, we need a spectrum. Now, and let me emphasize the value of adult daycare. That will allow more people to, quote unquote, live in, age in place if they are in a family home. If they're living with their children or something like this, the adult daycare Monday through Friday provides respite, a place for that you know, person to go during the day uh, so that they're getting some social activities. Um, it really was wonderful you know, in our situation uh, because my husband just can't walk out the door and go down the street. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the other thing that uh, a lot of the doctors are saying when we had the stuff on memory care is social interaction is so critical to retaining your facilities. It's different than doing Sudoku or the crossword puzzle, right? And uh, so I think it's good. That's why places like Priya Living and or the CCRCs like the Forum, they provide an, op an easy opportunity for that type of socialization. You know, it's still a problem. Even in our, our memory unit, you've got a spectrum of people. Some of them are, are really almost unresponsive or, you know, they, they sit and stare at the wall because that's really all they're capable of doing. And there's other people who move over there because they're really having memory difficulties, maybe can't live anymore with their spouse uh, because they can't handle the day-to-day -day problems, but they're actually pretty sharp. They actually still stay on top of the news and things. So you get, you get these problems where you try to do daycare things for people and it's not appropriate for everybody. Some won't participate at all. And some of them are 
quite bored because it's not as good as the uh, interaction they were getting back in independent living. It's a, it's a very difficult problem. And I think we're probably better off in a place that's a, a CCRC with a spectrum of care, but it, it doesn't make the problem go away. It's still there. So a couple Go questions ahead. on the chat uh, for Dave and Mahash. One is, are, are your places require you to commit for a long term? And the second is, how is the vaccination issue handled at your facilities? What are the second questions? The second question, how is the vaccination issue handled at your facilities? Okay, so I'll start off on that. Uh, our places are uh, uh, a model of lease rental. You don't buy the property. We don't sell property. So you come and lease the place for as long as you want, but the minimum is six months because unless you stay for that period, you don't get to realize you know, what values you're getting out of these facilities. And uh, I'm happy to say that whoever's come and stayed with us is here to stay with us forever. That's it. I mean, the, the next destination is right up there. So that's, that's the kind of uh, thing that we have. And people have moved from Wisconsin, from uh, New Jersey, uh, from Atlanta and all the places. And then they've gone back and sold their homes. All of them who are living with us have now sold their homes. And they're living and pre living is their, is their uh, place to live at. So as far as the vaccination is concerned, we are on top of it all the time. Safety of our uh, and health of our seniors is the first priority. So we, our, all the people in our uh, facility got vaccinated by February, March. Right, both the both the vaccines, and now that we are getting ready for getting ready for our booster shots now, and even the staff that we have working were all vaccinated. So we are on top of all this, like I said. So health and uh, you know security of our seniors is is a prime factor that we look at. Yeah, vaccination is a is a ongoing problem. Of course, when when the COVID hit, we we sort of closed our campus. It used to be rather open, and now we have a guard, twenty four hour guard, out at the main entrance. And they ask you if you've been vaccinated and if you haven't, you're not supposed to come in. And uh, if you're having any symptoms, you really can't come in. Uh, they check your temperature, but uh, it still gets in. You know, we have a couple of staff people who are breakthrough cases. I don't think there's been a breakthrough case among the residents. Everybody here is vaccinated, but you know, it's just a matter of time. It's gonna, gonna happen. Uh, vaccination is, the, is a probabilistic barrier. It's not perfect, right? What you know, was the other question? Uh, there was the vaccination question. Uh, and the other was, uh, oh, commitment. commitment. Yes. Yeah. The, the, uh, the forum is a, a sort of, illegally, it's a condominium association that owns its own health center. So you have to buy a share. The share is a unit you reside in. So people own their unit here and you could in fact sell it, people do. There are a few people, uh, you know, one or two a year probably who decide they want to move back out with their, I, I had a good friend who left to move out to his son's place in Chicago uh, and he sold his place. After, after his wife died here, he decided to move in with his son. Uh, but most people are in here to stay and they ultimately their estate will own their unit and it'll become part of their estate when they retire, when they die. You know, the, the both, uh, I, I don't know whether Priya Living does this, but does the, do either of the, the facilities allow for younger people now? I mean, uh, Mahesh, you said the newer ones were, but I don't think the forum allows younger people, right? No. The, the, I think our average age is just below 80. And it's occasionally someone will move in in their 60s, but it's kind of unusual. And I'm mm -hmm. sure there's a lower, uh, the, uh, the lower limit is probably if you were 58 years old, married to an 80 year old, it would probably be okay. But uh, <laughs> we're not letting any 50 year old couples move in just because they like the environment. You gotta be a senior. Yeah, so in pre Ling, of course, like I said, we, we experienced this that, you know, uh, if we have a certain percentage of youngsters staying with the seniors, it, it, it involves into a beautiful balance atmosphere, you know. The seniors look at the youngsters as their children, you know, and, and, the, and the little little ones as their grandchildren. And the youngsters look at seniors as, you know, their parents, who they miss because, you know, parents probably back in India or whatever it is. So, and that creates a, a, a lovely, beautiful, happy atmosphere. So we decided that all our facilities should be multi-generational in the sense, but with a special place for seniors. And uh, 
Uh, and since we are independent senior living, unlike the forum, uh, we can afford to do that. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, that going forward, all our new facilities, since they'll be large facilities and they'll be built ground up, we are going to create a certain percentage of assisted living and uh, skill care uh, to the level that we can you know, provide the required caregiving according to compliances. So uh, we, like uh, Jean was saying earlier, that there is an acute shortage of trained staff to handle these very difficult stages of dementia, Alzheimer's, and other skills, this thing. Yeah. So until that happens, and that's what, you know, my talks with AARP have been on that, that let's develop that, that, you know, the caregivers or volunteers to be trained as caregivers who can come, who come to us so often. So something at least we are sure of that we'll have the right help available when we want. You know, the, uh, that brings up a, um, another interesting thing that we could do as a city. You know, we are, we are all, we often hear of uh, youngsters who are trying to figure out what career they have, they might be interested in. And I think one of the things that we could do would be to make, uh, uh, available information about what it would take to actually be dealing with older people. The other thing too, is that some people in their sixties, they retire from the regular job and they're still ready to do things. And, you know, maybe, you know, the 65 year old becomes a caregiver for the 80 year olds or something like that as a job, you know, earn money. And I think there's a, alternate ways we can look at this. It's actually a de facto, um, in my family, the 60-year-olds are taking care of the 90-year-olds. Yes. My mother is 98, and you know, she's just you know, in the last year she's gone into skilled nursing. Uh, but my sister-in-law's mother is the same age. And caregiving, regardless of whether you're doing direct caregiving hands-on day-to-day, requires a lot of energy and a lot of oversight. And particularly so if you're doing, you know, the a la carte as it has been done in my family. Uh, you have to stay on top of, you know, do the caregivers show up? Uh, you know, make sure that they're getting the services they need. Be the advocate, you know, checking out the insurance. I mean, there's just a lot as the parents age, their children have to be engaged. And they may actually be at this stage where they themselves are having to think about what if something happens to me, I'm not gonna be able to take care of these 90 year olds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, the, uh, the other thing that I think a lot of people don't understand is, you know, we're not gonna find a one size fits all senior housing solution, it just doesn't exist, right? Um, there are a variety of places such as Priya Living and the Forum and Sunnyview and Chateau Cupertino, Saratoga Retirement Community. There's a lot, there are a bunch of them around. Uh, there probably need to be more slots. Uh, there probably needs to be a, a bigger diversity in price points, right? But, uh, you know, we're going to have to think about all alternate types of things. Now, I know the Priya Living is not just for Indians because uh, when I was over there, you you showed me a couple of, of people that I mean there were yes. not of, of Indian ancestry, but um, you know there are other places that need to be there. They're going to be uh, ones for East Asians, one for people who who are a particular religion or anything like that. So when we we look at this, we need a, a diversity, and also as as I think a couple of you mentioned. Uh, there's a there's a large interest in maybe making this more intergenerational as well. So that's going to be. If there are other questions in the audience, I saw one, um, let's see, uh, from Piyush. Uh, this was for you, Mahesh. Does Priya Living offer meals? Uh, yes, uh, Priya Living now in Santa Clara comes under the uh, Santa Clara County Senior Nutrition Program. So, and because we have large numbers, they have uh, um, offered us food from an Indian kitchen. So we do, whoever wants to participate in that can register and uh, you get food at $3 a person uh, delivered by our volunteers to our place every day, five days a week. Uh, we also have the option of having uh, any kind of Western food cuisine, if you want, from the Santa Clara Senior Center, which at the moment is free of cost. Uh, and for the weekend foods, 
the firemen uh, in Santa Clara deliver it to our premises for our residents for the weekend. So we are, and like I said, going forward, all our 60 new facilities uh, will have a kitchen and a dining area and a cafeteria, which will meet the food requirements of uh, everything. Our rental will include the food and cleaning once a week uh, for okay. all the apartments, yes. You know, there was, there was another uh, thing came from Leslie. She wanted some clarification on who owns the things. And I believe Priya Living is owned by a corporation. And I believe Forum is actually owned by the residents yeah. as, a corp as another corporation. She pointed out that most co-housing communities are also owned by the residents. So they, they, they buy into a unit and go for it. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't mean that these are exclusive and I've got to believe there's some variation. Um, I know that there, for those of you who are not familiar with it, there's actually a co-housing unit um, facility in Mountain View off of, I think it's Calderon or one of the streets over, over in Mountain View. And it's not very large, it's maybe 25 units. Uh, there, there tend to be larger units and uh, they're around an old farm. So it's, it's a very modern facility, but for those of you who haven't looked at things, you might want to look at that. So uh, thank you very much. What's the that. name of that facility, Henry? You know, I'm blanking on it right okay. now, Mahesh. <laughs> uh, I will I'll put it out there. By the way, someone else asked about the graphic that I showed earlier with the age groups. Yeah. And I will, uh, I'll put that, we'll have that put on our website as well. Uh, so uh, you will have access to that as long as, uh, as well as the recording from today's thing. Well, we've got a few more four minutes. Uh, so what I'd like to do is ask the panelists parting advice. What, what, what piece of things would you suggest that our, we talk to, the, to our community about? So Gene, I'm gonna throw it to you first. Do you have any parting thoughts? Um, basically to become aware that there, that life changes and that you, in, you need to be prepared for changes and know what options are out there. It's, it's mighty tough at, with 48 hours notice to make choices. Yeah. Yep. Dave. Oh boy. Uh, I'd like to uh, really agree with Gene on that. I, you really need to do some planning and thinking about uh, what the likelihood of problems are for you or you and your spouse or you and with whoever you're living with and what's going to happen when the event happens. You know, it's, it's going to occur. You should really think about it and at least have done some research to figure out what options you have. And the older you get, the more imperative it is uh, burying your head in the sand and saying, well, I'm just going to age in place and then hoping nothing bad will ever happen. This is not really a good retirement plan. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, so just as a plug for the next hour, um, a lot of what's being discussed in the next hour and the financial considerations revolves around planning. Mahesh, what about you? What, what parting I advice? I absolutely do you? concur with uh, Gene and Dave about, you know, people should realize that everybody is going to age ultimately, right? And to say and put this off to the last moment, it is not a really happy thing to do. I think one should as you age, plan these things well ahead to know your options, where you're going to be, because there are so many different stages and types of facilities that you might have to go. Like Jean has experienced that, you know, with her husband at one to one, they are within a short time. Deterioration takes place very fast. So you should plan this ahead. And fortunately at this, as we speak, we have facilities available to us. We are talking about improving things in these facilities. Uh, so even at a younger stage, when you're 44, 45, 50 years, think about these and at least write down. I just at this point of time, I just wanted to say that I was surprised that when I came to Priya Living and I asked people about what do you do if somebody dies in your household, they didn't have a clue. You know, because it's different. In India, it's totally different. In America, it's totally different. Funeral home has to be involved. Police has to be informed. And there's a list of checklists of things to be done. And so I got our friend, uh, Hung, you know, Zoe from our Rotary Club. She, they all have a family funeral home. Come a couple of times to Priya Living to talk to people, although they thought it was a taboo thing to hear about 
who can't talk about death and all that. <laughs> but now they realize it's so important. You know? So all those Absolutely. things, we've got to plan ahead. Actually, Hong, what, what about you? Any parting thoughts you have on this session? <laughs> I do. Um, I do believe we need to build communities. In our 60s, 70s, we need to find a community so we can leave for the next, live until we have to go like my hashtag or somewhere else. And we build our own community. So we are, we leave from our home. So if you wait until your 90s, then people have to move you into a facility. You feel like you're moving somewhere to die. But this way, if you live there for 10, 20 years, or even 30 years, you are dying at home. So my advice is, and which I am going to do in the next 10 years, I'm going to move myself into a facility so that I can make that my home. Yeah, my, my wife and I are struggling with this very question. Um, I still live in a five-bedroom house right behind Monta Vista High School. And uh, I feel I feel I feel bad because I know that's depriving some family of taking advantage of our wonderful schools. But, you know, we kind of got that. Well, we just kind of raised our babies here. And, you know, now what are we going to do? Uh, by the way, the other thing is I've had to take care of my parents, you know, when they've had and they were but they were, they were in Kentucky, which is like another country and uh, takes just as long to get there as it does to get to Taiwan. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And, and I can tell you, taking care of your parents' finances and their property and all their stuff is a real, real hassle if you haven't had to do it. So, uh, you know, try not, let's try not to do that to our children and, and let's find something. But with that, you know, because we also, you know, you remember that graphic at the beginning? Well, we moved here in our 20s and then we got older. <laughs> Well, the, the other thing too is not only did we not bring mom and dad with us, which meant gave an older population, uh, our family is our friends, our neighbors. Yes. You know, in Cupertino, this whole area is wonderful because we've got great neighbors. And so that's why people like Gina and I, we don't want to leave the area. <laughs> that's our family, right? Hong, you're there yeah. too, right? So those are the things that I think we need to look at and we need options because we don't have enough options because one size doesn't fit all. Well, with that, I'm gonna give everybody a three minute break and then we'll get our next panelist in. I wanna thank Mahesh, Jean and Dave for this. Uh, if you wanna stick around, by the way, at three o'clock, uh, we'll dismiss the audience, but you know, we'll, we'll open up all the phone lines and just have a, an after discussion if you can stick around. If you can't, thank you very much. Uh, someone asked about the video being uploaded. It should be uploaded by the end of this week. And uh, we're going to try to put a new um, uh, easy URL out there, which I think will be tiny.url slash CLF dash seniors. And I'll, we'll send that out with uh, the um, other information to anybody that registered for this after that. So with that, let's go ahead and take a two minute break. Uh, Carrie, could you put up the poll for the next session so that people can start to answer that? Thank you, everybody. It was so yeah. wonderful seeing all you wonderful people and talking about these things in life for the seniors that we need to. Thank you so much. See you in three minutes.
Okay, um, let's get started with the second panel. Uh, so the today's, oh, by the way, in the uh, chat, if you wanna look, I just created the new tiny URL. So it's tinyurl.com slash CLF in caps dash seniors in lowercase. And that'll get you to the page that has all of the information about the Library Foundation's um, programs that are related to our seniors. And if you go and click whether on the housing or, or the memory care, you will get a, an, another page which will show you uh, any of the materials that were given out as well as all of the videos. Um, with that, uh, this next discussion is actually going to be about the money problem. Uh, because all of these things are expensive. And we know that it's, it's sometimes a daunting thing to be able to deal with the financial considerations. And so for that, we have two people amongst us. And, and this is really fun, fun because you know, I'm a former president of the Library Foundation, as is one of our, our panelists, Bob Adams, who is a former president. And then we also have Kieran Varshnan. Kieran, you need to turn on your screen. Uh, because oh, Karen, sorry, Karen can, is, can somebody help with the video? It's, it's disabled. Well, let me check on that. Thank you. All right, that's great now. Okay, great. So Karen is the present president of uh, Library Foundation. And she has also just changed, uh, what, two years ago or something from your high tech job doing <laughs> biomedical and devices and stuff like for Phillips and, and is become a realtor. And so she is, she is all the person I turn to a lot of times to ask about, so what do we do with the house? <laughs> because that's one of the big questions. So with that, uh, Bob, one, oh no, what we gotta do is ladies before gentlemen, right? So Karen, I would like to first ask you to, um, to introduce yourself and your situation. Okay, sure. And thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Henry. Uh, so nice to see you all on our panel. I, I know uh, most of you and the previous session was also uh, really, um, really on point on some of the topics that relate to but actually all of us, um, whatever the senior categories, I don't even know what that age is anymore. But all of us are thinking about it. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, what is the right choice for us? So as far as I'm concerned, um, now today on this panel, um, as a licensed realtor, um, I did uh, switch into this career. One was also, I, I mean, for me, it's a connection to the community, uh, more than really a job or a business. Um, and this is something that's uh, very dear to us at, at personal level for us. Uh, our parents, most of us are, are dealing with that too on, on those choices. Uh, so it, it's, it's an area that I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned and uh, very involved in. Uh, so happy to be on this panel and happy to share my perspective on real estate and uh, choices that you may have um, about your current home, the private home. Thank you. Bob. So uh, thank you. Um, my wife and I have actually lived in Cupertino for over 30 years. Uh, and uh, probably the most relevant, and I've been very involved with a number of nonprofits in the community, uh, as well as Cupertino Rotary. And for those of you who are looking for a service club, you might think about uh, Cupertino Rotary or are there others as well, because they're really communities within communities. And that's very helpful at times. Um, the, um, Probably most relevant, uh, my re most relevant work history to this uh, this particular panel is in 2003. I, I started a retirement planning practice, uh, and I'm also a certified financial planner, and I have a master's degree in financial planning. So I've been through these kind of discussions with a lot of people over time, as well as individuals in my family, and we've all learned a great deal in the process. And it is a big transition, as we'll talk about uh, more later. And planning is always the key. Well, we had a, a we had a pre meeting earlier this week that uh, you know I think we had to cut it off at one hour because uh, the the panelists kept coming up with things, and I have over a page worth of questions, and Bob has reorganized those into eight categories or something like this, but. Um, 
you know, I think the, the one thing that, uh, you know, the P word planning is, is kind of the key thing. But, you know, Bob, Karen, you know, you, you can only plan so much. Well, where do you start and when have you done too much and when are you driving yourself nuts? What kind of advice can you give us on that? Well, I'll begin briefly. Uh, so planning is important. And yes, you can drive yourself crazy. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I find, sometimes I had somebody show up in, in, in my first appointment with a spreadsheet of all the expenses they expect to have over 30 years and looking at inflation and all these things. And of course, uh, you know, you have to be flexible and there's always this, as they say, um, have you gotten that call yet? So things change in your life, things change in your family's life, uh, and you have to be flexible. But the key is that you can do some planning to look at alternatives so that when that those things happen, you're at least aware on a thumbnail sketch what you want. And communication is an important part of that. You communicate with your, your partner, with your kids, so that everybody kind of begins that discussion. And beginning that discussion early is, is certainly important. Um, it is a journey of learning and everybody that's here is, is already on that, uh, started that process, whether it be just with this today or, or with earlier discussions. And as we've seen for the earlier panel, there's a lot of possibilities out there. And uh, you know, we, we can also talk about things about how you fund these and the limitations on, on all this. But the first and foremost thing is to start thinking about the possibilities and start investigating them and look forward. Um, the, uh, one other comment, there was a, um, a survey that was done and this is about 10 years old, but I'm sure it's so true, uh, that the average person in the United States spends more time planning for their annual vacation than they do for their retirement. <laughs> and what happens is, people become what I call date dependent. They've decided that they're gonna retire at a certain age because uh, their parents did or their friends do or uh, you know whatever. And of course, things, things change because uh, transitions happen, health or otherwise. But for the most part, people retired. And what I, what I suggest to people is that they wanna to retire to something that requires some planning as opposed to retiring from something. And that's the case, and I would say 80% of, uh, of the people that, that I've dealt with, that I've worked with. Well, you know, that, that actually, that, that's really sage advice, Bob. Um, and I do know it's easier to think about vacation because that's a fun thing. Quite frankly, this isn't a real fun thing to think about a lot of times, unless you do what you just suggested, that's retiring to something. So there's something that's there to attract you. Now, the, the biggest problem that we have a lot of times, so a lot of us are lucky that we actually own a house in Cupertino or the surrounding areas. And as such, we have a major asset, you know, it's worth a lot of money. But then we have to decide, well, what do we do with that? And to that, I'm looking to Karen because, you know, it's not easy to, to figure out, are we selling it, renting it, 1031, ADU, da, 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 you know, what are we doing? Okay. How, how, how do you think about that? Right. Um, so that, that, that's a very good point. And I also absolutely agree with what Bob said earlier regarding uh, planning and, and, and basically just getting down to it. Now, when you talk about our homes, um, it is, uh, in most cases, it is our biggest asset. Right. And now when we are looking at um, financial planning or retirement planning, the home is a very central component of it. Um, in terms of timing, I would say, actually, in our life, we will probably just buy the home if once or at maximum twice. So it's actually never too early to start thinking. I'll give you an example. Today, I was talking to a friend of mine. They were looking at buying, they have some money. They were looking at, I'll just take a minute, Look, uh, wanting to buy um, another property, maybe a one bedroom for investment. I've talked to her just after two months and she said, Kiran, I think we should just think about buying another home. 
both my kids have moved out of here. They've gone to college, maybe another six months. And she's already saying that I want to probably buy a single level home. I think it's very smart. I mean, she's only 50. There was no need, but she said, let me forget the investment. Let me just go forward, sell this and go there. So this, this decision, there's so many points regarding your home. Um, and every time you have making that decision, I think it's good to think what is the real motivation um, and for how long I'm going to be there. And then talking about options, uh, when you mentioned Henry, for example, a five bedroom home, yes, I really, it's an opportunity. Um, we are lucky uh, and on, on average, you have uh, folks above 60, um, between 60 and 70, 20%, this is across the United States, own their property outright, okay? Wow. So that, that, that is their equity that they can make use of. Um, there are a number of reasons and options to move. One is, of course, financially, you're not even using all the rooms. You have all this real estate, even if it's paid up, it, it, is, it is a financial component, it's invisible money that you are giving away for no particular reason if you are not having use for all the bedrooms and all the square feet. So that's anyhow a motivation to think about. There could be, of course, reasons which are related to health, which many of us, in, for example, in my case with my parents, it could be too late and basically thrust upon us at that time as a caregiver at short notice to find a solution, either to leave the home, sell the home, just take the parent and move to an assisted living um, community. So at that time, you've really reduced all the options into, into literally only one. So thinking about the homes with all the options that could be there absolutely sooner, and there are two other things I would say. One, it is a comprehensive discussion. It involves the family, it involves your health situation, and it involves your financial planner. So you need to kind of look at all of that, look at the various options. And as you mentioned, could be renting, could be part renting. We have new policies on ADU. We have the Prop 19 enabling you to move anywhere in California. And we can talk more about some of these things in the rest of the afternoon. Uh, but there are many options, many things to consider together when thinking about um, what comes next uh, after retirement, uh, where am I going to be living? What am I going to be doing? You know, there's, um, it's confusing. I mean, my wife and I are going through this, you know that Karen. Um, and we, um, we, we need to figure out, you know, how to even know what the options are. Mm -hmm. One of the things that came up in the previous sections is sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do you, how do you get out there and find this out? So, um, you know, it, it seems to me almost that we need to have like an ongoing set of workshops mm -hmm. <laughs> just to talk about these things because it's, it's not trivial and it's, and there, and there are many options. But, um, the, but you mentioned not only that, but, uh, you know, Bob, you had mentioned another thing that people ca haven't thought about a lot because it had a really bad reputation, and that's the, the reverse mortgages, mm -hmm. things like this. And I know a few years ago, that, was, that really had a bad rap, but you said that's changed now? Well, it has, although, you know, uh, when, when something gets in the mindset of the public, it, it, it remains for uh, generations. So uh, basically, uh, Reverse mortgages have actually been around for a long time. And, and I think the best way to think of them as a tool, and they're not right for everybody, but when they were first introduced, there wasn't enough uh, regulation around them. There was quite a bit now. And so it was kind of a wild, wild west. And unfortunately, there were financial actors, banks, and others that took advantage of the situation. And I mean, in terms of charging outrageous uh, sums for uh, interest and fees for applications and, and things like that. And uh, also the, it was clear that the, the people that applied for this didn't understand sort of the back end. They were comfortable with the front end of getting the money, but not understanding how they asked to resolve at some point in time. And quite frankly, the banks probably weren't too forthcoming because 
they were looking for people to come into the process. Um, that's changed. And as a matter of fact, the government requires that a certain amount of education be provided and verified with the applicant before they can actually proceed in the application process, which is all positive. Again, you see infomercials about this, for example, I think Tom Selleck does some. When I see that, I go, oh, <laughs> I know, that, that's not gonna help, that's gonna hurt. Uh, but that, nonetheless, banks are looking for business. There are uh, only three uh, lending institutions in California that actually are involved in this. There's a number that front those banks, but basically a re the reverse mortgage is, a, is the basics of a reverse mortgage. And because it's because of the name mortgage in there, you think about you paying somebody. But in fact, what happens is, and the amount of uh, money that's available to you depends on your, your, your age and uh, the property value, but basically you can get an income stream from that. And that as they give you money that, goes into the loan amount, so the loan amount uh, increases. Uh, and at some point in time, usually either when you die or when you leave the property for 12 months, uh, the bank's gonna expect to have to get their money back. And that can be done by you paying off the loan. Most times that's done by selling the property at that point. Um, but again, this is not, not for everybody, but it's something to think about. And in this situation like we have in, in, in California, a lot of times people have, might have multi-million dollars of equity in their home, which by the way, you don't need to have a paid off loan to get a reverse mortgage. But nonetheless, you have a lot of equity in your home and uh, maybe you don't have as much in the bank. And uh, of course, over time, things change with your finances too. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a tool that somebody should, the people should look at. Well, I know another thing that several of my neighbors have done is they've rented out their house and moved into something smaller. Uh, sure. Sometimes as a trial basis, just like what is it like to go from 3,000 square feet to 1,500 square feet? Karen, how, how much are you seeing that in the rental market, especially around here? Yes. Um, well, it also, um, the way we are looking at it is, is, is in the following. Um, uh, interestingly, in the last, uh, last year and this year, uh, the market has appreciated um, beyond the normal. So normally if you go back to, I don't know, 20 years something, is, is about 6%, 5 to 6% Bay Area market um, mm -hmm. continues to grow on average. Um, but last year in most counties in, in the Bay Area, it has been more than 15%. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's gone crazy. So this year, a lot of people who were thinking and that's the right thing to do, is if they were thinking to sell in the coming period, they may have moved into the market because it's a good time to sell. So they have tried to capture the momentum and make their decisions. Renting out is also a really good option, especially considering if one wants to give it a try in a different location. So for example, if somebody is here and they want to go to, let, let's say uh, they have a child in San Ramon. In fact, I'm dealing with a case like that. They live in Cupertino. Uh, they, are, they are retired. They don't know whether they should leave the home, but a very good option is to go to San Ramon because their children are there. Now, they can absolutely try this out because they are also concerned. They might, you know, miss the family and the, and the, and the, the friends and the community uh, in Cupertino. Uh, so that's one option. Although renting out, to keep in mind, you still have a number of costs still ongoing with your home property tax, home insurance, maintenance, repair, not to forget managing the tenants. So probably you want to hire, strongly recommend a property manager, right? And then in certain counties, there are policies regarding tenants and especially in difficult cases regarding eviction. So all of this needs to be kept in mind and definitely consulted with a real estate professional before one thinks, okay, let me rent it and let me see um, if that's, um, that is just something I want to do. So all of this needs to be considered. And if I may add one more point regarding uh, the financial um, uh, side of it, just a very simple one is the um, rental income is considered and taxed at income. 
Uh, so again, that needs to be considered. It's not free money, it will be tax. So depending on what tax bracket the people are, they have to you know, take care that it is not just the full cash. If it's rented at $2,000 for, for whatever, if it's a small unit, uh, you don't get $2,000 to keep. The, you have to deduce all your expenses and the income tax that you would be paying just to understand uh, the most important factors related to renting. Now, the, the thing that I also have learned is that, but if you rent your unit, your house, for a couple of years, you can do what's called a 1031 exchange. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I know I one of my neighbors did that. Yes. Um, yeah. So. so with 1031, so there are two things again. Uh, renting out, there's also uh, a tax treatment one can do on depreciation. Again, to take care, if you depreciate your home so as not to pay tax, you will have to pay later. It needs to come back at some time. So when you're selling, you have a deputy, you have, you'll have greater capital gain tax. Mm -hmm. Talking about the 1031, yes, 1031. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not a financial expert or a CPA, uh, so one would need to consult with them. Uh, but just broadly speaking, it applies to investment properties, like properties and certain categories. Um, and they are, um, there are a number of restrictions um, or let's say a number of conditions that need to be complied with, um, which are to do with uh, the amount of time, which is quite short, it's about 45 days to identify the new property from the time you sold the previous one. So the like property and about, I think it is 186 months to complete the transaction. Uh, so those are some of the considerations one would need to have um, to have kept in mind before getting on that path. Bob, is, is there anything you want to bring up on that? Yeah, just a, a quick one on, on the 1031. Um, there, those deadlines you, you spoke of are real, of course, and the, uh, the state and the federal uh, folks uh, don't let you deviate by one hour. Uh, they were very harsh about it. So you want to be sure that you're working with a realtor who has experience with 1031s. And also realize that 1031s are primarily for they're not for primary residences, they're really for investment properties. However, and you have to work with a CPA on this, there are ways to bring, to bring an investment property back into a primary residency, uh, but you have to do it carefully. Uh, you have to do it within guidelines of the IRS or you will, uh, you will be in audit hell. Pardon my, pardon my English. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, Gavin and, and Uncle Joe both want to get paid. And, yeah. you know, and it's important. We have to pay our taxes, right? But uh, there's no freebies. But uh, you, you also mentioned something the other day about uh, the complexity that's also happened with these, these new propositions in California. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us have heard about the Prop 19 and there's being legal challenges. I mean, explain that to us. What, what's going on with that? Okay, so um, yes, as you have uh, just mentioned, Proposition 19, it was passed uh, with the ballot proposition um, and it has gone into effect, I believe it is 1st of April. I did write the date. It has gone into effect April 1st, uh, 2021. So what it does is um, it allows transfer of property tax basis to another property anywhere in California. So that's the, that's the change from the previously existing props, which were, I believe that was 60 and 90. Uh, the first one being within the county, 90 being across certain select counties, and this one allows you to go across California. It does apply to 55 plus, uh, one of the owners being of that age, and certain other classified categories of homeowners, like those that may have been affected by wildfire and other disasters. Um, it can be done as compared to the previous law, it can be done now three times rather than previously it was allowed to be done only once. It only applies to the primary residence. That was always the case, that's even now the case. Um, and um, you can buy up and down in value, so the replacement property, which is your replacement primary residence, can be up or down in value. If it's 
down or equal, that's you get to maintain your uh, tax basis. But if it's higher, it's adjusted. And there's, there's a very interesting mathematical formula for that, which probably I don't want to go into right now. But yes, it does give you an advantage to carry your low tax value base of your home um, to a large extent uh, across California. Yes. Mm. This is actually uh, a tremendous lo a new law. The other ones that you mentioned, 60 and 90, had some severe limitations. They were only uh, being available in five, five counties within in California. Yes. Uh, and so for downsizing folks, uh, something we haven't talked about yet that I, I, I see all the time is that grandchildren become a magnet. And I see people <laughs> who, who wouldn't even know, wouldn't even have thought of this six months before moving across the country. Of course, this provision would help across the country, but it shows you what the, what the, uh, what the draw is. And so I see people, grandparents moving, all, new grandparents especially, moving all the time to help their, uh, to help and 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 help uh, help with their grandkids, watch them grow, uh, be part of their lives. Very very uh, big draw. So those of you that think you might not be moving, uh, you know, you might have a move before you get into a continuing care uh, environment. You might have a second house tomorrow. Uh, Henry, uh, you're in, you and downsizing, for, for example. So there's a lot more transitions. That, that's good news for the real estate industry. But that's a tremendous deal because property tax, remember Prop 13 insulated a lot of people. My, my mother, I was raised in Mountain View. My mother in 1947 and my dad bought this, bought a home there. And you know, the property tax was $542 a year. $542. So even, even moving today, as, as we talk about how property taxes have increased because values have increased, you might have bought something uh, even 10 years ago and you might have a property tax of $5,000. Well, now if you go to another house, you might have a one of 15 or $20,000. So this is a huge deal and something that shouldn't be underestimated. You know, you, you mentioned transitions and I remember us talking the other day about transitions. And, and, and in fact, in the last section, we actually talked a little bit about transitions. I think people generally think it's a one and done thing. You know, if I'm moving from the family house, making one move and both, that's it. Now, maybe if you go to a, a continuing care facility, you can think that way. But even then, inside of it, it's not going to be that way because you may still need to do assisted living or memory care or skilled nursing or one of you goes one way, the other you goes a different way. I mean... When, as an advisor, Bob, when you think, when you talk to your people about, you know, what transitions to expect, how do you have that conversation? What are some of the elements that you bring in? Well, first of all, you know, we're going to think about longevity and, and we're going to, and we're going to, I think over the next 10 years or so, think even more differently than we do today about longevity. You might think about, if you're 65 years old today, you might think about, Longevity is being 25 years, depending on your uh, family history, et cetera. Well, I went to a very interesting presentation a couple of years ago by the head of the Cleveland Clinic. And by the way, they have a website with a lot of interesting things on aging that you might want to check out. And the point he was making was that it's not so much the 25 years. It's what new things will come out over those 25 years that will be extending uh, life and again, hopefully quality of life uh, by another 10 or 15 years. So we know there's going to be lots of transitions. We just talked about grandkids, maybe it's grandkids and then at a certain point it's something else. So you have to be flexible and it also brings uh, puts a premium on planning and thinking about things in terms of a series of transitions, not one transition, but a series of transitions. And those transitions are started usually by a work change, maybe from work to uh, non-work. Then later on, they're, they're uh, triggered by health, health uh, kinds of issues. Uh, and then later on, you know, it's interesting, when I talk to somebody about estate planning, for example, almost 100% of people I talk to, they don't, they don't talk about when they die, they talk about if they die. And that's just the way we think. 
So you have to have that conversation. You give examples of other people. I give examples of my own family and extended family. Um, and then, but, but most people have had other experiences as we've talked about before in their own family. So, uh, you know, th that's the way you start the conversation. You know, that's, uh, it's, uh, it's funny because my wife and I literally this morning were talking about longevity and, you know, we say, well, we have plenty of money to last, you know, and we'll just state a number, right? You know, 90, 95 or something like that. You know, we just take the money and divide it up, divide it by 30 or something like this and say, okay, that's what it's going to yeah. be. <laughs> but the thing, the thing I'm hearing also is, first of all, you just said that number could be not 30, it could be 40, which changes. Most likely. It. But also, uh, you know, uh, I, I just know from watching my own parents, the, what you spend on changes as you age, mm -hmm. you know? Yep, that's why you can't just have a spreadsheet. The other thing about that is inflation. And mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times people bring in a spreadsheet and we talk about things or they come up with some national number dividing, like you say, and then they, and then the tagline is always, but I haven't thought about inflation. And of course, you know, we know that, you know, inflation is corrosive. It's, it, it works just like growth in, in the opposite way. And so uh, one has to think about that. On the other hand, one, so one has to be realistic when they model things on, on what growth will be, what inflation will be. Realize that models are sensitive. So, you know, if you think you're doing yourself a favor by modeling 5% inflation going forward, you're gonna end up living in a cave. That's not a good idea. Um, but so, so you do have to look at that and you, you also have to worry about being too conservative. You know, some, you know, you walk, you, you know, you, some people just throw their all their money in CDs. Well, that's going to dramatically change your, your, your outcome going forward. So there's a happy, happy middle, middle ground for everything. So Henry, I have, uh, I was reading an article. And so, by the way, I've shared some references and, and we can, we can uh, share them with our audience uh, after the, after they went, uh, but I was just uh, reading some uh, some data points just to uh, share, and I thought it was quite um, uh, quite an eye opener. It talked about that sixty five percent of those between sixty and seventy years old, they say they find it very easy to live on their own, but only forty three percent do after they are seventy years old. So what you think? 10, 15 years prior changes quite dramatically later. Um, two in 10, so two in uh, 10 persons is um, 20%, above 70 say they cannot live independently. They need some help in their daily routines. And here we haven't even yet talked about one of the factors. The one thing we do talk about is um, uh, for example, you have uh, you have the stairs in the home. You talk about home. One can do home modifications, right? So you can have your um, your railings. You can modify stairs. You can um, you know use the downstairs bedroom. Um, you can you can address to some extent the mobility issues inside the home. What about outside? So when we talk about the social interaction, meeting with friends, uh, most of us today are driving somewhere to, to meet them, right? But if, if driving becomes an issue, and uh, if, unless we have some easy and cost-effective other options, one starts getting bound in anyhow inside the home. So the very fact that a lot of people may select the social interaction, being part of the community, that very fact, if they are staying put or staying in their current home without having considered that may actually inhibit them from having the social interactions, which primarily was their reason in staying at home. So it is kind of a paradox and very important to understand, um, you know, what are the different factors? Um, I know we all talk about the psychological factors, which of course is a given, uh, that people have attachment, they have memories, you know, they talk about Thanksgiving dinners um, inside the home. But when, when that age comes, when that, you know, what are the day-to-day -day issues that become difficult uh, rather than that once in six months or once in, you know, year event that one is looking forward to? Just, just something to consider in terms of weighing in as factors. 
You know, I, I th I'm glad you brought up transportation because uh, it's, it's a big challenge. I mean, many of us, our eyesight starts to get, get problematic, uh, especially at night, you mm -hmm. know, you see stars and you, you know, you can't, you can't really detect things as well. And we don't, we, you know, we're worried about our own safety and we're also about worried about safety of others. I mean, I'm just hoping that these self-driving cars actually work quickly because, you know, it's going to hopefully intersect before I need it. But, uh, <laughs> but there, there are other things too. I know that the city of Cupertino and it, unfortunately it coincided with the start of COVID-19, but they had experimented with the via shuttle. And uh, they were, they were, I see them driving around Cupertino and these were low cost shuttles just to move around. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of believe, wondering whether it's gonna be a via shuttle or Uber or self-driving cars or a, a set of those that are gonna address this because it's, you know, that's the alternative. We're, if we're aging in place somewhere, that means we have to go somewhere else. Whereas if we're at a, a facility that has, you know, a lot high density, you know, you walk downstairs. But the good news is, Henry, the Via Shuttle is coming back very soon. Probably, oh, very good. Um, yes, probably by early October. Okay. So the city is going to resume that. We did a survey and did a lot of demands for it. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of questions, quick question for um, our experts here. One is on the chat, uh, someone asked, can you quickly explain what is 1031 exchange? Mm -hmm. And another one is, what are the disadvantages of Proposition 19? For mm -hmm. for heirs or so that are two quick questions. Yes. Okay, okay, I'll try. Uh, ten thirty one. So ten thirty one is um, a tax treatment in which um, if you are selling, uh, it applies only to limited uh, amount of uh, categories of real estate. Uh, it has to be, it does not apply to primary residence, but it can apply to investment property. And uh, there are other uh, properties owned by businesses. So what it allows them is if they sell the property and they have made capital gains, by capital gains means just the difference between the sale price and the price at which they purchased the home. Uh, so let's say, well, if I take an example in Cupertino, if somebody bought a home, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago for 500,000 is going to be 1.5 million now, perhaps. So they've made a gain, if it, those are the numbers in the example, you've made a gain of a, a million dollars. Um, if it's an investment property, different considerations, tax treatments apply to primary residences, and I can mention those. But if it's an investment property, um, you can fold in, you can fold in those gains into another similar, it's called the like property, that's how they say in IRS. So it needs to be again an investment property um, and like property, and you can avoid um, the capital gain tax or uh, significantly reduce them. But then your property, the new property that's owned has that 1031. If you sell it again in the open market without folding in a new property, all of the taxes that you did not pay will obviously apply at some time. Uh, so this is all calculated based on um, actually a base value of, of the home, which only a CPA can calculate for you. It involves a number of factors, the modifications, depreciation, all of that, uh, the, the cost of sale, the cost of transfer, the purchase price, obviously of the new property. And, and then still this is if it's all um, meeting the criteria of like properties, even then the cost calculations is pretty, pretty complicating. But yes, it does allow, um, it does allow the, the, the saving in the capital gain tax if you fold in into another like property. That's broadly- be Before we get into the yeah. Prop 19, mm -hmm. um, one of the things I said, because my neighbor actually did this mm -hmm. is they rented out their Cupertino house for two years. And I think if you rent it for two years, then it gets, you can consider it a, a commercial thing because you it's a rental. Mm -hmm. And then they changed that with a 1031 and they've actually bought two things mm -hmm. based with their Cupertino money, right? And, and those are, are, and they had to rent both of those out because then it's still rental. But mm -hmm. then they were able to change one of them to a residential. Now they had a CPA to help them on this. Yes. But yes. that was one way they did it. And I'm sure they had to pay some taxes on that. I, I don't know how that works. Yeah. By the way, it doesn't change your, uh, 
it, it probably doesn't change your property tax situation though that the prop 19 gave you so no, uh, because now it's now now yeah. it's commercial not residential so prop 19 probably does yes. so you win on one and lose on the other yes you cannot exactly prop 19 very different tax treatment advantage applies only to primary residents so absolutely very two different cases which is also fair you cannot have you know kind of um, multiple things applying in terms of benefits um uh, talking about Prop 19, yes. So then uh, let's say, what is the, the other side of it? Uh, the other factor that came in through the Prop 19, while we got some advantages on um, uh, allowing uh, for the primary residents to carry that tax value for certain categories, it is going to limit the inheritance. So if what, what it's not going to limit the inheritance. So what is going to limit is that unless the inheritance is again going to be treated as a primary residence. So if it's not, the tax basis of the inherited property is going to go up to the market rate. So in previous propositions, um, it allowed the primary residence as long as, um, the, let's say if it's from parents to a child, the parents were the, having it as primary residence, they did enable that low tax rate the low tax value basis to be transferred to the child if it's inherited by the child. But now the child needs to also show that it is their primary residence. So that's one, and it still limits um, this uh, amounts to 1 million. I believe that's the amount. The rest is going to be again adjusted. So it's going to be then kind of a mixed rate if the property is above $1 million. So it's, it's again, it has, um, it has other side to it. So it, while it's allowing the current owner is giving them more benefits so as to relocate and carry that, um, let's say the lower tax basis for the property tax, it does not uh, transfer that low tax rate as it previously did once inherited. And I know that's one of the reasons people are upset with it because mm -hmm. they wanted to give yeah. it all to their kids at a low rate. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like Karen, our professionals, Karen and Bob, uh, this is not mm -hmm. one size fits all. Everyone's no. um, their financial conditions, their uh, future yeah. outlook is different. So would you recommend that people like me who really don't know much about this seek professional guidance as early as possible or what's a good timing to do it? Yeah, so um, I'd strongly, yes, strongly recommend that. And especially even the ones I have talked about, I am nowhere near an expert um, because I'm a realtor, but even so, because these are real estate laws, uh, you need to have um, a, a certified CPA on your side to consult with. Uh, and pro probably, especially when you are looking at inheritance and you want to, one wants to understand that, uh, probably also a real estate attorney or a trust a lawyer to explain better on how it applies to that individual and what may be the right, um, uh, what, what may be the, let's say the more beneficial choices for them uh, based on their situation. I strongly, strongly recommend that. Um, regarding the timing of this has gone into effect. Uh, so some of the things are actually mute, but okay. Um, other things could be, uh, could be done, but more importantly, at least it needs to be understood correctly and it does give options to seniors 55 plus and, and other categories. So that could be quite beneficial, at least for those of us who are sitting here and looking at other uh, options and moving and relocating, it is advantageous on, on that side, yes. Yeah, I, I think the- uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Aaron. No, go ahead, Bob. I, I was just gonna say I, I, I'm probably on uh, Prop 19. I think the biggest advantage is that it pertains to any place in California. Uh, and just like any new law, it will probably be interpreted, reinterpreted over time. Uh, but, um, you know, just that, just that move anywhere kind of approach uh, is very advantageous. But like anything else, you know, as you say, one size do does not fit all. And that's one of the interesting things about planning is you really have to look at the, the whole put your uh, arms around the whole corporation, so to speak, the personal corporation, and look at what people's individual needs are. 
uh, and that, that's part of the planning process. Uh, as far as when you do that, uh, it depends a little bit on, on uh, you know, what your age is, and that's one determining factor. But also, you know, there's people that are, that, uh, are planning on working until they're 75. Well, maybe they're going to end up wanting to plan slightly later, but realize there's other things that, come, that can come in and, and upset that. Um, but in general, I think that the earlier you start planning, the better, because remember, you have to plan for accumulating those assets too, and think about what you can do as well as what you want to do. Uh, and that's going to demand, uh, because while your house is a great asset, uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about 35 or 40 years, uh, that may not be enough, uh, depending on what you want to do. You know, the, 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 the one thing we've dealt a lot about housing, but I'd like to also shift a little bit and talk about health care, especially memory care, because that's, that seems to be like a major unknown cost for us, and it's extremely expensive. Um, I know that cost of going into a skilled nursing facility can be uh, uh, ten, easily $10,000 a month or, or more. I mean, I've heard of one in Palo Alto where it's like 18000 a month. Sorry. You know, and memory care is another thing, too. And uh, I know my sister's mother-in-law, she was in memory care for, geez, going on like eight or nine years. And she didn't recognize people. And, and there was a real, real challenge with that as well. Uh, so when, what, what advice can you talk to us about? Because, you know, you know, memory disease is a problem and it's, it's a significant problem. It will hit, probably hit all of us to some extent, but you know, are there, are there things that you, either of you suggest in, in terms of uh, thinking about how to put that into the plan? Well, if I can start, uh, geography matters. Um, if you're, and this is across the spectrum of, of types of, of uh, care, uh, if you're sitting in, in Cupertino versus Sacramento versus Kansas, those, those costs are different. Uh, and, and that's something to be looked at. On the memory care space, I believe that we're very early on in that, in that program. There are very few facilities and those facilities therefore can charge really high rates. Now there is more cost for those agencies, but I truly believe that when more supply comes into the picture, that those costs are gonna go down. They almost have to because the costs that I've seen are just you know, border on ridiculous. Uh, but nonetheless, if you need to, if, if you are level and need the care, you need the care. Uh, and you know, in a lot of cases, in some cases anyway, uh, that can be uh, handled on a, on a home care basis as well. There is a certain point though where that's no longer possible. You know, the, one of the things people ask about a lot of times is, well, will Medicare take care of it for me? And I believe that the limit on Medicare for both skilled nursing and memory care is like 90 days, which is a very short amount of time. It is, and you can buy long-term care insurance, but be careful with that because the, the cost escalation on premiums is outrageous and is not limited in California. Therefore, um, and, and to be fair to the providers, uh, a lot of them price their policies when they didn't really understand what they were getting into. Uh, GE and a number of companies dropped out totally for that reason. But, um, but nonetheless, you can have, uh, you can pay into this program for 10 years and all of a sudden the price doubles and you go, I can't do that anymore. Well, all that money is just gone. So you mm -hmm. really have to be careful about that. Uh, and just be, be advised that once you, once you sign up, you're pretty much signing up for life. Um, one, one of the things that I heard, I, I don't know if it was Dave Stearns last time that mentioned this, is that, you know, when you buy into something like a CCRC, which has, uh, if it has a, a skilled nursing and a assisted living and a memory care, you, you're, it's actually become sort of a long-term care uh, insurance package because, they get, uh, if you're a, if you buy into a place like the form at Rancho San Antonio uh, and you have to go into one of these facilities, there's the market rate and then there's the internal rate. And the internal rate's a lot less than the market rate, hint, hint. 
So, you know, if you get, that's one of the, uh, the advantages they say of buying into those things. But that being said, it's, it's pricey even then. And once, and if you don't know how long you're going to last there, well, that's, it's a multiplier, right? Yeah. And Henry, uh, one of the things uh, which we have, I've heard panelists also uh, mentioned earlier, and I think Hank also uh, uh, spoke about that you may need to have um, kind of a, a time plan, a phase plan, and um, moving out of your current family home, it does not really mean uh, going to assisted living, right? You may want to move, let's say, to a home that's closer to certain amenities. So we also talked about um, senior daycare options, right? So it could be with that reason. Of course, mm -hmm. it could be downsizing. Um, it could be wherever you can get uh, care at home cheaper or easier. So there, there are several reasons and several ways to think about it. And in fact, uh, Henry, as you as you talk about, you know, cost. Um, at um, um, some of these, uh, let's say, pretty advanced uh, the, uh, facilities could be quite expensive. Uh, sometimes it is, it may, again, not one size fits all, it may turn out cheaper to stay in your own home and get the care you need on, on, on the required basis or to, let's say, move to, I would say, your ideal home close to all the amenities that you can try to get. It could be the shopping, it could be the library, uh, it could be the daycare. So various ways to look at it. It's not just either staying or selling uh, and moving to an assisted uh, or, or um, kind of a nursing uh, care facility. You know, one of the things that I said last last session was, you know, the the boomers options are going to be different than, you know, our parents options. Mm. Right. And we're demanding different things. And recently I heard of a facility and they're building out uh, units for seniors. And a lot of times they'll they'll do three bedroom units for seniors, because if they need a caregiver, they want to have a room for. Them, right. That's well, right. it, tur it turns out a lot of times you, you don't need a dedicated caregiver. You, you need a few hours a day. And uh, instead, what they're doing is having th two, three, or four units uh, share the price on, a, on an independent unit just for a caregiver. You know, and, and that's part of the package. In addition to paying the caregiver, they provide the, uh, the housing. And, yeah. you know, clearly then they're right there and it makes it a lot easier. So I think, you know, you're, I, the, what you, you advise about can think of the conveniences. I think that's the whole thing. But that gets back again to what Bob's always been hammering on about plan, plan, plan. <laughs> Got to think through all of these things. And unfortunately, it's not like it's obvious. What, one comment I could make on, on uh, in, in uh, home uh, care. Uh, a lot of times people will go out and grab somebody that's a family friend or relative. Uh, they, they need vacations, they have uh, problems, you know, which cause them to not be able to, to work. You really want to look at an agency for that because the agency will backfill somebody for you so that when the person can't show up because they're sick or they have jury duty or whatever it might be the case, uh, you're not left high and dry. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's something that I've seen uh, play out and in, in it's important to, to think about. Well, uh, audience, uh, we are almost at the end of, of the, uh, the allotted hour. If you have other questions, please uh, go ahead and put them in the Q&A or the chat so that we can get to them. But, and we just fired up the exit poll. We'd, we'd appreciate it if you could take some time and answer this because we try to figure out what's really going on. But uh, with that, I, was, I would like uh, Bob first, maybe you could give a, uh, you know, your parting thoughts what, what, what sage piece of advice would you want to give? Well, uh, you know, we've already talked about planning and I'll, I'll just mention it again, <laughs> but no, it is important. And, and part of it is just beginning that conversation. And that's really what you're doing. Uh, and you're going to feel a lot better. And remember too, that there are times and it can be very unexpected where uh, you get in a situation where the person that uh, becomes has a competency issue or, or something else comes up and they can no longer participate in that playing. So you want to know what the, what their wishes are. And it's very important to start early uh, for that, for that and other reasons. 
And remember that transitions do happen. That's part of the whole process. So you need to remain flexible, informed, and retirement planning and planning for a living is not a one-time event. It's, a, it's an ongoing event. Karen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, I, I would say, I think I also I did mention earlier a kind of a comprehensive approach uh, considering um, your, your financial, financial situation, uh, also the health factors as advised by your healthcare provider, your family, because no matter what they are involved, whether even if you go to an assisted living, you go to a uh, downsizing, they're always involved to, to help you. And I think their opinion also matters along with your own. Um, and I would also say in real estate, just kind of one note, it's, it's more than a transaction. Uh, so if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're looking uh, for a realtor, of course, um, you know, look for a good reference. Uh, somebody who is known to you, referred to you, but also somebody who has the patience and the understanding to see what are your objectives. And it is not that they come in and, and you know, sell the house for you and then go away in six weeks, uh, but much more than that. So kind of seek out uh, the actual professionals that are there uh, and are willing to talk to you and, and consult with you and, and, and give you information, irrespective of whether you're going to hire them or not. Uh, and, and then I think the, the final uh, thought is um, uh, really see this as an opportunity um, in the sense of options and choices. Uh, it may allow you to travel if you want to sell your home and uh, have kind of a smaller place or, or go try living elsewhere. I don't know, maybe in Denver, I have no idea, but that's a place I have not been to. So I would like to go there. Uh, so I, I think there are various options. Uh, and I think even when we are having this conversation, I think most of us are quite fortunate. And we are talking about assets. We are talking about living longer. We are talking about options. We are talking about wonderful community and friendships. So I think we are blessed in every way and we can find the, you know, kind of our ideal uh, choice and we can make them ourselves. Um, I, I know we are trying to time, but one example, we recently moved my mother um, closer to my sister. The house is not sold. She has walked out of her house with a bag. It was a huge discussion what all she wanted to pack in that one bag. <laughs> having said that, having said that, two days or maybe three days near my sister, she is so relaxed. She's eating again. She's happy and she's telling me, I'm so happy I made the decision. She was also very happy because she took a flight. She never thought after 90, she will be taking the flight again. And she said, I enjoyed it. And maybe she can go to another daughter now taking a flight. So it has opened up opportunities and thoughts for her more of more of freedom than of being tied down to the home. So just wanted to share that as an experience. Long way, you know, what, what, what parting thought would you give our audience? You know, um, this makes me, and I think makes a lot of people think, we are all going to have to deal with our situations when we're getting older. So to consult with professionals and look at all options and be uh, sensitive and be uh, knowledgeable in what can be done in the future and plan it right now is, is the way to go. And also maybe encourage um, builders, our cities to uh, have more senior facilities that's optional. It could be co-senior facilities, it could be generational so that we have options. So options financially and options realistically so we can plan our future. So let's uh, work on that together. Well, uh, it's about time to leave, but I wanna give you a couple of my parting thoughts uh, as we finish up this series. Uh, Dr. Mugamian from the memory care series, one of the things he advised was, you know, do your bucket list early. Because as you age, even if you have, a, you have early stages of dementia, you're going to get worse, not better. So do the things that are going to bring you joy and value with your family early. Don't put it off. And I think the same type of thing happens with our house. What Kieran mentioned, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. I'm, I'm experiencing that myself because we bought a, a small place with one of our daughters in Santa Cruz. 
And I go over there and it's an itty bitty place. And I have essentially two or three drawers of all my stuff. Well, I got my tools, but you know, that's a different thing. But um, you know, the, the whole thing was, is it's amazing to me is how much lighter living actually takes a burden off you, which is a, a thing is that, you know, for a long time, it's us owning the house. And I think that sometimes it's the house and all of our stuff owning us. And um, so, we, you know, got to give yourself permission to, to, you know, shed some of the things and go off to do things. Yeah, it's great. Get there with the grandkids if you have them. I don't have grandkids yet. I'd love to have them. But, you know, at a certain point, they don't want to do it. One other thing I want to point out, and I was looking at the exit poll results. And, you know, we have that word library in our name, Cupertino Library Foundation, right? We love our library. And um, one of the things that we are looking at is what can we do with the library? And for those of you who haven't been over there recently, you should go. It is open and you will see a major construction project because the city of Cupertino is partnered with the Library Foundation and the Library District, and we are building a new set of program rooms. And that's going to open, I believe, Kieran, in January to the public. We're hoping for that. Yeah, early next year. Early next year. So yeah. what that'll make available is space for us to have lots of meetings. And one of the questions we had here was about discussion groups. 100% of the people that answered says yes, they would like to have discussion groups. We are also talking with mm -hmm. our high school district, the adult school, about offering workshops. So we want you to advise us on the things. The Library Foundation is an advocate for the library and an advocate for the community. We will help to amplify your voice. Now with that, uh, I will, I'd like to dismiss the audience. You can feel free to leave now without being disrespectful or anything. But also if you would, we're gonna stick around now and I ask all the other participants to go ahead and unmute and join with video. And if you raise your hand, we'll unmute you as well. And uh, feel free to have, to join in the discussion. Uh, so thank everyone. Thank you speakers. Thank you panelists. And uh, thank you my co-moderator. Thank you, Mayor Darcy Paul. Uh, and uh, I, I wish you all a great afternoon. So anyone wants to raise their hand and, and be unmuted, just let me know. So Henry, there's a question in the q and I, I, I just saw it. Um, is that something you want to... What's the 1031? What is it uh, saying? Money rent with next property. Yeah, yeah. so that... Hmm. I think that the idea that I understood, at least, and it may have changed, is that you're supposed to take all of the money that you got out of prop, your first property and put it into the next one. And I don't know what happens, any excess. I assume it just gets taxed as W-2 yes. income. Yes, right? yes, yes, it is. And, um, yeah. uh, it'll be taxed as, as capital gains. Capital um, gains, yeah. But um, you can always add money for the new property. Oh yeah, they like you to add money. <laughs> Although right. that will be, you know, the CPA has to has to track everything, right? That yeah. can be kept separately, at least in terms of calculations, when you decide to sell that and not do a 1031 again, that will be taken care of. Right. Uh, yes, you can add money. It doesn't need to be exact, but it needs to be equal or more. Yes. Yeah. Or, or multiple, or multiple. I was a little surprised we didn't have more questions in the second session. We had a lot of questions in the first one. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe we just had it. But uh, yeah, some of the uh, some of the poll questions were kind of interesting. What they're looking at, and I think what uh, we saw from the first set of polls was that uh, a lot of people were are are still very early stage in their thinking. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it calls for the need for us to really think about what other types of programs we need to put on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these are. Uh, um, these, there, there's some weighty things. Uh, we are, and Karen, as you know, uh, we're talking with the library right now about increasing the size of the collection we have in the library on research materials, reading materials for, yes. for these areas. Yeah. And, um, you know, they are, they're going to try to put together sometime in 2022, even a kind of a, a little central hub area for it. Yeah. So that would be really yeah. good. So Henry, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that and we can uh, 
we can try to um, uh, to speed that up. We can also relate it to, let's say, um, you know, we did the senior series and all the references related, you know, kind of categorized or pointed in a certain way so that uh, folks can find them. Um, but um, two other things, I mean, we talked about, I didn't see the results from the last poll on doing the kind of the smaller group workshops uh, because we talked that we may have, how did you hear about this? Yeah, um, I just I just shared the poll stuff and yeah. there was, um, you know, so would you like to hear more, like more information from the library and, um, 10 out of 13 said yes, and three out of 13 said no. Yeah. Um, would you be interested in participating mm. or listening into future discussion groups? That was 100%, 13 of 13 said yes. Yeah, so is, that could be an idea because we, we talked about a lot of things. And as you know, Bob had made that list, I mean, and obviously we couldn't cover it. More than that, I mean, I definitely want to say that nowhere near uh, I'm expert in some of the things we talked about. So mm -hmm. probably even get those uh, like uh, maybe um, a real estate CPA or uh, any of these associated topics that we talked about. Let's see who can come and talk you know, more about it in detail. Somebody who is you know, working with 1031 mm -hmm. exchanges all the time. You know, um, you know also, I, also, I think uh, you know, the area of estate planning is also an yes. important area. Yeah. Uh, and that really, uh, I, I talk about that all the time, but it really needs to be uh, an attorney that talks to a wider group about it. Yeah. Uh, and, and it is important. It's very yeah. important. You know, the thing is on, on this type of thing, I think it's good to have something like that as a talk, but I, I actually favor workshops because, yeah. you know, it's, oh, not yeah, a yeah. One, it's not a one size fits all. And what I've found is that a lot of times you need to walk through different types of examples yes. and it's a multi-day thing, yeah. right? The workshop is, is probably a good good format for that rather than a panel or a presentation. Yeah. Let me throw something out. Well, uh, I was talking with someone from a church group and I said, uh, she was not able to attend this today. I said, if you like, show it at a church group and we'll, I'll, I'm happy to come and discuss it. Mm -hmm. Because as we have found with the senior center, not everybody is comfortable with Zoom. No. And in fact, we have people, you know, and I think it's the members of the senior center as well as their children mm -hmm. need to be at least starting the discussion about this. And that means different formats, not necessarily just Zoom. You know, we uh, we actually sent out because, you know, just the the series that we've done over the last 12 months, you know, we've dealt with things like scams against seniors, uh, memory care, uh, laughter yoga, this housing. And we're, we're looking at actually doing one on loss, guilt and grief and guilt uh, within, you know, maybe by the end of the year. I mean, nice. these are things we, we need to we we would be happy to take you know these things we could take the video and show the video and then you know just like we just with the video we just had but then have a discussion afterwards yeah. and i think that would work well mm -hmm. i would love to actually you know if we can get the senior center back open again i'd love to do it there yeah yeah i also want to mention because we do have a uh, because we do have hungry our uh, city council member darcy is probably also um, on the call um it may be also an opportunity um hung if you can if you can help us and CLF would love to do this with with the city is um enabling conversation on what are the what is really coming in the city or or the surroundings i don't know how you want to do that but some of the things that darcy talked about hung you talked about so for example transportation maybe it could be other factors not just pure housing but other amenities uh, that could be also probably interesting to bring to our seniors uh, for which obviously we as as just um, residents don't really have the full information i think there is a very good opportunity in the housing element process for yeah. the senior group to to talk a lot about this yeah okay okay then we can we can follow up with both you and our absolutely well, absolutely it would it would be what public is, yeah what's the number that we got to hit for the next eight period for the the housing elements uh, okay, lot. so the, yes, the uh, housing element for 2023 to 2031, the eight-year cycle is 4,388 units. 4,000. Uh, 
for and then it's divided into hold on a minute, let me get exact how many low very low income low income uh moderate income and uh, above moderate income let me give it to you now give me a few moments to find the email okay you guys talk about something else you know, well actually now that you mentioned those those categories mm -hmm. you know not everybody in cupertino owns a house right. i mean we have quite Absolutely. a few people have been yes. here for 20 30 years and mm -hmm. are renting one of the things that they may not realize is that some of these other areas, the low income and moderate income categories have some pretty high limits on how much income you can be having and still qualify if you don't own a piece of property. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can see some moderate income be a below market rate housing just for seniors like that. One of the things, however, I've noticed with all of the housing stuff pretty much is seeing seniors are pretty much ignored. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, because all of the emphasis is on, you know, level and, and, and in fact, our BMR manual needs to be modified because the qualifications for BMR assume you have income. Yep. And, you know, and, th and that's, that's, you know, uh, I don't even know if they count um, your social security, but I uh, assume they would, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a very different situation. Well, the criteria for qualifying on their point system include, do you have a job in Cupertino? Well, if you're retired or on social you security, you don't have a job in Cupertino. <laughs> that's very true. That's, that's a pretty glaring problem. Maybe what we have to do is form our own employment agency just to give people. <laughs> Rotate people on the desk at the senior center so they can qualify. There you go. There you go. I like this, you know, figuring it out. Yeah. Um, you know, Hongwei, you know, I guess one of the questions is, is how might we, we have this conversation with the city? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure nobody, no one in the city is saying well, we don't like our seniors residents i'm sure that's not the case but you know it, once again we've always been a, a a city of thinking about growing families that's yep. why most of us moved mm -hmm. here right mm -hmm. well you know again the housing element process is a great way to start a conversation with the city yeah we have to build 4380 units and so um where what what's the need of the community there's going to be a very um extensive community outreach. So this senior group needs to go and say what the pieces that you were just talking about here. So okay. I'm, yeah. So as an outsider to the city council, I'm just wondering, you know, when we when we have a proposal for a, for a housing, we generally see opposition to it based on the, the impact it might have on schools. And I know that school enrollment's going down and such, but I'm just thinking that in that context, senior housing, which usually does not come with kids, would be seen as more advantageous to the to the city council, perhaps, and to others in the community. I, mean, I might be wrong about that, but that that just seems like it would be a natural fit. So um, during the um, housing process, we will have a we will have consultant who give professional research. So all these will be researched. And they all have um, statistics, they'll have, you know, so this is a whole city process and we have to do it. Uh, the due date is, Jin can help me with is, I believe January 1st, 2021. No, no, 2022. <coughs> 2023. <coughs> so the, the, uh, the thing is, is that, uh, that there's gotta be a certain value that we as a community have in keeping ourselves here. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, you know, okay, if I move to, to nearby Sunnyvale or San Jose or something like that, that's fine. But, you know, I want to stay within five miles of kind of where we are now. Uh, 20 miles is a little far, right? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, what, what are, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering if there's any kind of philosophy or, or value we have, because once again, you know, my friends are the, are the, parents of my kids' friends, you know, for the last, for their first 18 years. And, you know, that's how I want to be around. 
Well, well, that's why we need to think about this as a regional issue as opposed to a, a city by city issue, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think well, so too. Yeah, because if we have all the housing is ju not just for Cupertino because it's the, no, the regional. Exactly. So a, a regionalism is what we need to work on. And actually I'm telling you privately, a lot of my friends saying, if you have a senior living facility in Cupertino, we're going to move here. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, you know, look, the, the, yeah. the thing that I think people have to think is, is that the states wants us to have these 4,300 to 4,388. Mm -hmm. 4388. And by and large, what that means is they want something like 4388 times two people to move to Cupertino. So we're, we're looking at nine or 10,000 people. Yeah, In the next 10 years. So, so right. sort of in the next 10 years, right? So right. we try not to scare people because this is a facing in things. Not everybody's going to move in Zoom. And also the city is in, in charge of getting this um, planned and have zoning changes. However, it is true that we can plan it if the, the landowners doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. But yeah. th in this process, we will have to talk with the landowners first to make sure that the landowner said in the next eight years, oh yeah, well, I, I could do this. So and you can't it, just assign it not talking to people. Well, so that's the, also yeah. a different process. The other thing about it, Hong, it's not just about, uh, not just about housing. I mean, we mentioned, you know, you have to have the services because Absolutely. we need mm -hmm. additional services. You know, some of them are strictly senior related, such mm -hmm. as adult daycare or, yeah. you know, or we have a very, we will have a very high need for rehabilitation mm -hmm. places because Absolutely. when you yeah. go to get a, your hip replaced or you had a bypass surgery or something like this, mm -hmm. you need to go spend, a, you know, a week or two in, in some place. And if you have to drive 10 or 15 miles away, well, you know, that's a real pain. Yep. You know, I think, yep. I think that's one of the real advantages also of being things like, the, like the CCRCs, but, you know, we need to just have other places for rehabilitation close by so that we can do this physical therapy then has to be a thing. Or you know the some more adult daycare or other types of activities. I mean, we tend to think of the downer stuff like the negatives, but there's also all the positives. What are the things that we want to do to keep ourselves alive and and active? You know, educational things, because I you know De Anza College could do more for us, right? It doesn't have to just be for 19 year olds. Yep. Yeah. And, and then. Um... I can't find the numbers right now off my head, but with this 4,388 units, they are a quite big chunk for low income, very low income and moderate income. That means we're gonna bring our service people in, we're bringing our teachers in. So that's gonna be, be really beneficial for any right. kind of a senior housing or housing that we're building. Right. So it's very important to bring them in here to live close to work. And we're like, um, you know, I don't know who, uh, Dave Stern said, the foreign has trouble finding caretakers mm -hmm. or, or cooks, cafeterias. And so uh, I think it's really important that we, we complete this in the next 10 years to bring service people into our region. And as, and as important as the housing is, because we can't build enough houses for the service, for the number of service folks that we need, mm -hmm. transportation is also very vital. Uh, absolutely. And, 10 years, we've got to do it together. Yes. And remember that transportation benefits not only both sides of that, of that mm -hmm. quarter, uh, both in terms of where people can live and where yep. they can work. So just give you a ballpark, if I remember correctly, the above market rate, just market rate housing is about 1300 units. So you're looking at 3000 units of low, very low income and moderate and about 1300 around that range for market rate housing. So more for service people, less for the market. And, and I you think know, it's important. Yeah. The, the question is, is uh, as you had said, you know, it's the, it's the people doing the building that actually spend the money and get these things mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, quite frankly, I would be happy even to see 1300 market rate units become available if, oh, if a large number of those are available yeah. for seniors. I'm not looking for a below market rate place, mm -hmm. yeah. but I'm looking for good options. Absolutely. And then one thing I advise this group, our group is to have um, real plans. I think the homeowners are looking for real plans, right? They yes. say, oh, senior what, 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 what's financially available, how they can um, 
economically build it, they want to make some money, right? They're not going to just build something yeah. for service. So how can, how can this group provide a, a couple of protocols that say, hey, this will work? Well, you know, one resource that I, 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 I suggest the city to use mm -hmm. is the most valuable resource we have in the city. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, it's not our children. It's us. Yes. Yeah. You know, we yeah. have so many yep. extremely talented people who have held all kinds of jobs in, yep. in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Cupertino. And that brain trust can be an amazing tool to actually getting things done. And it's just, we need, we need to coordinate. I just think this is a great opportunity to plan senior housing options for the next eight years. So well, I think, uh, we I think if, really if, if we, now. if we do what, you know, mm -hmm. the thing about, let's think about our services needs. Let's mm -hmm. think about our employee staffing needs. And let's think about people that have developmental disabilities, you know, because mm -hmm. that's very similar actually in many ways to, to memory care. We have to think, how do we, we deal with all of those things as opposed mm -hmm. to just taking them one at a time, one project at a time, you yep. know, it'd be nice to have a coordinated plan. So this would know. be the co holistic plan that for the next, for 2021, 2020, oh, I can't think, 2023 to 2031. It is, should, it should be a co holistic plan for all everything you say, Henry. Yeah, so, well, that'll be good. Yeah. I'm, I'm just afraid that it'll only deal with housing and it won't deal with the services. And No, the, I think they'll talk about it as a whole. Okay, the, great. In, the end product is the housing, right? But the, as a whole is where transportation will come from. You know? mm -hmm. Henry, we have to be vocal. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, and what we have to do <laughs> is like all of these panelists, we've got to get people up there talking, talking, talking. Mm -hmm. uh, because, yeah, and one of the things talking about business that people tend to forget is we have more money. We're yes. not spending it on our kids. No. Yeah. They eat and, and drink, okay. And, 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 and seniors, seniors tend to vote. <laughs> vote and they spend money and they have, and they money, have money to spend. Yes. And they're fit. Okay. And they're fit. As now. Okay, sorry, guys, I have we to go should, now. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, we, sh we should call it quits. I want to thank uh, anybody that stuck around to listen with us and uh, feel free to contact us and we'll send an email out at to, as a follow-up to all the registrants with information on today's thing and the videos. Okay, everyone, thank you. Thank right. you very thank much. You. Okay. Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate you coming on and <laughs> giving your great. perspective. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.